you guys will have forensics. Okay, bye guys. All right, um, I'll just get started now, I guess. Uh, here, um, if I figure out how to screen share, okay. Okay, can, can you guys see the screen? All right, um, I guess we can just get started now. Uh, today we'll be doing entomology and DNA analysis. So first for entomology, it's basically the study of bugs, right? And for bugs, I like to think of the very hungry caterpillar. So um, there's a nice visual, um, but like, just to keep in mind, entomology, we're not gonna be really talking about caterpillars here, but I just thought it was like nice. All right, so before we actually get started, um, I think some things that you guys wanna know or like some little bit of vocabulary, I guess. Uh, so the carrion is, uh, or like decaying remains, carcasses, it's like a dead body. And then PMI, that's the post-mortem interval. So what that is, is basically it's how long a body has been dead or like, how, long, how much time has passed after um, something has died. And then like the other thing that you guys probably wanna know is necrophilious insects. So these are the insects that tend to colonize a decomposing body. So they're like, I, I would say like, they're the insects that go to a dead body. All right. so. Forensic entomology, it can be uh, broken down into three categories. Um, today, we're gonna be mostly uh, focusing on um, medical legal. So basically what that is, is it's evidence gathered through the study of insects in a decomposing body. So um, like when something dies, this is basically studying using the insects um, to find things about the dead body. And the next is um, urban, which is, uh, it deals with both civil and legal crimes. So it's not all like murder and all of that. Um, these insects, they feed on both the living and the dead. So they're like, um, let, uh, they're like infestations and stuff. So think, cockroaches and bed, bed bugs. And then lastly, there's stored product. So um, stored product entomology, it studies insects found in food and stuff like food contamination. So um, kind of like if you found bugs in your cereal right after buying it from the store. Uh, this also like urban mostly deals with like legal crimes. So not murder, that's why, you know, um, so it's not as like gross as um, medical legal. So um, I guess that's something you can keep in mind. Okay, so what is forensics entomology? Um, this is basically the study of, um, oh, okay, that didn't work. Okay. That's basically the study of entomology, of uh, insects that play a role in a crime. So again, like we said before, um, it's kind of like the, uh, using these bugs to determine when a body died. All right, so here is, uh, so today we're gonna be again, mostly talking about medical legal uh, entomology. So what a medical legal entomologist does, it they determine the PMI. So again, the PMI is the post-mortem interval. And that's basically like, again, how long the uh, body has been dead for. And another thing that they do is determine if a body was moved after death. So like if somebody killed, uh, say, um, a rabbit and well, what you can determine from the entomology and all of the bugs in there are, did the killer move the rabbit after they killed it? Or well, like, did the killer like, kill the rabbit, leave it there for a while, and then move it. And then next is you can determine the presence of uh, presence and the position of wounds on the body. So 
I think we'll get more like deeper into these different topics um, in the presentation. All right, so some background info. So what happens after death? So there's three stages of death. Um, well, these are the three mortis stages. There's pallor mortis, algor mortis, and rigor mortis. So I like referencing entomology. These aren't as important. Um, I also do not recommend that you Google them. They're kind of like, I mean, you can Google them at your own risk, but you know, highly do not recommend. And then there's five stages of decomp decomposition. These are uh, a little bit more relevant to what we're gonna be talking about today. So the stages of decomposition are fresh, bloated, active decay, post-decay, and, um, and I think skeletonization. So what fresh is, is that it's basically the stage of decomposition immediately after death. So, you know, in your gut, you got you have um, a lot of anaerobic um, organisms. So these anaerobic organisms will multiply in your digest, well, not your, sorry, in the digestive tract in a dead body. And what that does is it causes a bad odor. Um, after the fresh stage, you have the bloated st stage. So the bloated stage just means that the gases caused by the anaerobic organisms, because um, these anaerobic organisms will release uh, gases uh, after like, you know, doing their cellular processes and stuff. Um, so these gases will build up in your digestive tract, not the, sorry, uh, in the digestive tract. And this makes the body look very bloated and makes uh, the stomach look a lot larger because of all the gases in there. And then after your, the bloated stage, there is the active decay. So in the active decay stage, um, the body begins to lose like all the fluids and tissues and kind of gets like shrunken, if that makes sense. And then afterwards there is post decay. So the post decay is um, that there's very little remaining body mass. So like, all, a lot of the tissues are gone. A lot of the body fluids is very like shriveled, kind of disgusting. But at this point, the temperatures also change. So like, you know, the body goes cold, if that makes sense. And then lastly, there is skeletonization. So this is probably, it's like the last stage. Um, so there's only bones and connective tissues left. So there's no more biomass left for the bugs to feed on. Um, and this is kind of like, what you would think of a skeleton. All right, so these are um, what comes to that uh, comes into death. Uh, well, not into the, into the body after the death. And according to these stages, um, there's different um, there's different animal. Sorry, uh, bugs that come to the um, body. So. At the fresh stage, there are bow flies and fresh flies. These are always the first ones to be at any death. So I would say um, with an, uh, if there's like a lot of bow flies, a lot of fly, like just flies everywhere, that means the, um, the PMI was very like short and um, it was like say freshly dead, if that makes sense. Um, and then after the fresh stage, there is the bloated stage. So the bloated stage, it contains some fresh insects and these insects like the flies begin to lay eggs. And then after they lay eggs, there is the active stage. So in the active stage, there are maggots, like lots of maggots, all, you know, all like creepy, crawly, disgusting. Also, I forgot to mention this, but um, if you're eating while watching this lecture, I'm really sorry, but um, there is the post after active again, you know, like the next stage is post decay. So post decay, um, these insects start to go away because um, it loses a lot of all of that um, body mass and like the flesh, body fluids and stuff like that. So the, a lot of the insects don't have um, things to feed on. And then afterwards, you, with the skeletonization, um, there are the bones and they're kind of just there for shelter at this point. There's nothing really, they can't really feed on them. 
All right, so um, next stage is um, there are major types of bugs like uh, necrophilious insects. So the first kind, um, and I would say one of the more the more important one is uh, our flies. So flies are always the first to arrive at a dead body. So um, I would say they're like the most common out of these are uh, blowflies. I'm not gonna try to pronounce the um, scientific names because I'm really bad at that. But one of these is very accurately named, you know, thinking about it kind of makes me want to vomit. Um, others, some of the other ones are skipper flies, uh, dung flies, and humpback flies. So when the fluids start to leave the body, so kind of like when active decay starts, it becomes not as suitable for many flies because as you know, these flies like to lay their eggs in like moist area. So there are cheese flies and again, kind of very suitably named coffin flies. Okay, so next there are um, beetles. So beetles, like mentioned before, they were, um, they were in the, um, they go into like the skeletons, but some of them also like, these come after the flies leave. And what they do is they eat like the dried flesh, the ligaments, the skin and the hair. So none of that like wet gooey stuff. Um, the most common out of these are rove beetles, but there are also carrion beetles. And like I said before, with the, um, with the um, vocabulary, there were carrions, right? And carrions are, again, the bot, like the dead bodies, carcasses and stuff. So um, these carrion beetles like to go to the dead bodies. So I think the name kind of correlates. And then there's dermistid beetles. Um, some of these beetles actually eat other insects in the body and some are cannibalistic. So um, there's that. All right, now there are is succession. So this is kind of like the order that um, that the uh, like animals come in. And um, so first there are necrophages, so like flies. So these are again the flies that always come first to the body. Um, afterwards, there are the omnivores. So these are beetles, like again mentioned, because they come after the flies. Wasps, ants, bees, yeah, etc. And then there's parasitic insects, and that I would say like kind of like maggots, even though those are technically flies. And then incidental insects like mites, pill bugs, moths, and etc. All right. So uh, one important thing is maggot development or the life cycle of a fly. Um, what this kind of helps with is. Um, these, you can kind of figure out the PMI, again, post-mortem interval, based on how old the flies that you see are, there are. So first is the first instar. So these are the, uh, these are kind of like, oh, by the way, um, I should probably like show this first. So this is the life cycle of a bug, right? And the, um, as you can see, like, uh, yeah, the, um, First instar is like the smallest um, maggot and these feed on like bodily fluids and stuff. And then as they grow up a little bit, so um, as the, the, the maggots take time to grow, right? So along with the maggots, the, um, the body, like time also passes. So that way you can figure out how long that the body has been dead for. So, um, in the first instar, the, these feed on fluid excluded from the body. And then in the second one, so as time goes on, and these maggots also get bigger. So these, they start around, start their first um, molt, and then they move around in like one big maggot mass. Um, that's also, it's very disgusting. But, and then in the third instar, they start to molt again. And then they become a uh, prepupa. So they start to go away from the corpse. And then, um, and then they change into a pupa. So once after this, they um, what happens is that they uh, they turn into a adult fly again. 
And um, once they're an adult fly, they feed on the protein like body fluids and they also lay eggs on the decomposing body. So these start again, but um, I would say like take this with a grain of salt because afterwards that the body will um, eventually not become a suitable, suitable um, environment for the um, bugs because as I said like before the decom decomposition um, stages will happen so like they can't feed on the fluid excluded from the body after like skeletonization so technically it's not really a life cycle anymore it's more of um, like it just a line a life I don't know like line or something again over here um, there's a there's like the beetle, oh, not the beetle, sorry, the fly, it lays eggs, these, and, oh, and by the way, this one can kind of show like the time that passes. So when it's a really small maggot, it can be like 23 hours, 24 hours. And then it kind of, as it gets bigger, more time passes again. So you can tell how long by, in like hours. So this would be pretty specific. Um, okay, so next, what does the life cycle tell you? So again, the life cycle does tell you um, how long these uh, your carcass, I guess, has been dead. So um, this is, so the eggs are like they're laid, always laid in the first hour of death. So after that, the eggs were, are going to be hatched, right? So before we talked about like the different instars and like the different um, stages of the life cycle so after the eggs hatch and you see like eggs hatched eggs that's um 24 within 24 hours of death and then um after that there are maggots when these maggots are like one centimeter long that's like pretty big for a maggot i would say um i mean it's like three days post-mortem and then they will grow molt grow and go through the whole life cycle again and eventually they'll turn into a cocoon so um that means like or like a pupa so that's like six to ten days post-mortem um if you guys don't know what post-mortem means post-mortem means pretty much after death so it's like six to ten days after death and then um adult flies that's 12 days post-mortem um again 12 days after they die or, or after like after there's a dead body. All right, so this, like these times aren't gonna be exactly like this because say in um, like summer or like in a really uh, warm place, the life cycle of will be a lot faster because they're gonna be re reproducing faster, right? Um, while in like cold uh, weather, there will be a slower life cycle. So say a warm weather and warm weather will be like, um, I would say it won't be as long or like if you see maybe um, an egg, it probably won't, an egg in the body, it probably will be a little bit less than 24 hours just because um, the life cycle goes so much faster and the same thing for cold weather. So if it's really cold and you see an egg, it might be a little bit more than 24 hours. All right, so some other things that you can figure out based on the um, entomology are that like has the body been moved so that pretty much means like again um has the like has um something died um sat there for a while and then moved to somewhere else and how you can figure this out is that are the insects on the body like native to the area where the body is um basically like say there's the body in one area Insects native to that area will go onto the body. If the, when the once the body has moved, those insects will not be native to that area anymore because it has moved locations. Um, so uh, the so that way you can tell has it been moved, yes or no. Um, knowing this, you can all but like with this. So if you have this, you can figure out both has the body been moved and um, how long or how long. Um, the body has been dead. Now, next, what you can figure out are where their wounds. So flies tend to colonize wounds first and then proceed to other areas. But if there aren't any wounds um, 
they will go to, um, you know, this is going to sound kind of like disgusting, but pretty much this whole subject is kind of disgusting. So they're going to go to like the eyes and the ears, mouth, nose first. And um, if anybody feels weird in like their eyes and ears and nose and mouth, and like now I'm very sorry, but um, they tend to colonize these areas first. But if there is a wound, they will all be in like one giant maggot mass in um, that the air, wounded area. All right. So um, I think I'll have, there are some practice questions and I think we're actually going a little bit faster than I expected. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, I hope I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to uh, run a poll and um, Okay, um, if I can figure out how to do this, but I think, um, all right, I don't think I can run a poll. Anyways, so I guess you guys can try to type into chat. So um, pra first practice question, I guess I'll give you guys like two minutes if that works out or, yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll give like two minutes and then I'll go over the problem. All right, so it's um, 422 now. So it's been around two minutes. If you guys didn't answer it, you can also put it in the chat, I guess, if you want right now. Um, so this, um, I think most of you guys, oh, actually all of you guys put A. So um, I, I would say, uh, like it could be both A and B. I've kind of forgot to mention this is multiple select, but uh, it, it's like this question, this one question is multiple select. I'm sorry for not mentioning that. But yeah, most of you guys, it's A and B because, um, but I think mostly B. So I don't know if I, I probably explained it wrong, but it's pretty much kind of B because um, when the, uh, it's the fre in the fresh stage, the flies start to come and lay their eggs. All right. so. Uh, Practice question two, again, I'll probably give you guys like two, uh, two minutes on this one. Um, again, well, this one is not multiple select, there's only one, one answer.
Um, also, if you're not sure, you can just give a guess, uh, like any random answer. And if you don't want anybody else to see your um, message, you can also send it like privately to um, the hosts and pan panelists. All right, so it's like 4.25. Um, so most of you guys were correct. It is A because uh, if you reference back into the slides, um, so when a fly lays eggs um, somewhere, it is um, one hour, in, around one hour into the um, like death. All right, practice question three. This one's, um, this one is also not multiple choice. Um, so, there's only one right answer. Again, I'll give you guys like two minutes to answer. All right, so I'm gonna, so it was C and the reason, okay, so B and C are very similar. It's just that um, B talks about aerobic uh, organism, organisms and C talks about anaerobic organisms. And I think if you guys have been through seventh grade science, I don't know exactly how old y'all are. So, but this is taught in seventh grade. So if you're not in seventh grade, um, That'll probably be ta taught to you. But aerobic means that they um, don't, they, sorry, they do use um, uh, oxygen. So while um, anaerobic means that they don't use oxygen. And one way you can kind of figure this out is um, that if you're in the digestive tract, you don't have a lot of like oxygen available to you to use, like, especially if you're, if like, um, if the body is dead, like, then there's no like circulatory system, nothing to bring um, oxygen to these uh, to these cells. So um, it, it will end up being anaerobic organisms are the ones that produce gas because there's they still can go through those um, processes and um, like the cellular processes. All right, so um, that's pretty much all like all of DNA, uh, sorry, entomology again my sincere sort of apologies uh, on if you guys threw up or not. I did, uh, well, okay. So next what we're gonna be talking about is DNA analysis, which I can assure you is not as disgusting as entomology. All right, so first off, I'm gonna start with CODIS. So CODIS is this um, FBI database. And I guess it's not super relevant, but it's still pretty interesting. So what it stands for is Combined um, DNA Index System. And um, basically it's where they put like the DNA um, 
like result, I guess, of convicted criminals. Uh, I just realized that criminals is spelled wrong. Um, yeah, sorry about that. But uh, and like missing people. So uh, what you can like with this, what they can do is like they can find a missing person and um, have like the family of this missing person, you know, DNA will somewhat match because yeah, they're related. Um, so it can be both used to um, confirm missing people and to identify criminals. All right, so what is DNA? Um, I hope you guys have mostly seen um, what this is and most, I hope you guys can recognize it, but um, in the chat, can you guys like write what you think DNA is? So I'll give you, you guys like two minutes. I think like two minutes might have been a bit long. So I'm just going to start explaining now. So DNA, um, so this is a picture of DNA, you know, the base pairs and the double helix structure. So um, here, I'll just like read us straight off. So DNA is an organic, organic chemical that contains genetic instructions, like a lot of you guys said. And these genetic instructions are used for protein synthesis. So they like kind of talk about how, they tell the cell, how do you create the um, proteins? So it contains a unique gen genetic code. So since this genetic code is unique to everybody, yeah, it might have some similarities with like your um, parents, siblings, cousins, all that. Um, it will, but like mostly it'll be unique to you. So since this is unique, um, like last week we talked about fingerprints, like since finger, all, just like fingerprints, how they're unique to, sorry, not last week, yesterday. Since they're unique to you, they're very um, useful for, um, for like forensics because you can um, do like criminal profiling because every, everybody has a unique genome. So DNA, it contains the base pairs of adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So like A, T, C, and G. So can anybody tell me uh, which one uh, pairs, like what pairs with what? All right, so um, good job for those to you, those of you who did answer. Um, that's right. So adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. Guanine, and um, this is like uh, this is uh, pretty important for later when we talk about PCR. So how DNA is used in forensics. So DNA can be used to identify perpetrators and clear the names of wrongfully convicted people. So like if you find like DNA such as like skin, hair, body and body fluids such as blood and saliva, if you find that like find that on like at a crime scene, you can um, take that DNA and like sequence it and like visualize it so that you can um, figure out who it is. And so you can both like say say who did it and say that, oh, this person who is in jail for this crime did not actually do it, so they should be released. 
All right, so first uh, we'll start with PCR or like polymerase chain reaction. So what this does is it makes a bunch of copies of one region of DNA. And I guess it kind of like zooms in on the DNA. And if you guys have heard of like gel electrophoresis or like something like that, this is different because it occurs in a solution. And also this is kind of like a um, precursor, not precursor, sorry, um, like kind of a step that you have to do before um uh before you do uh do what's it called uh gel electrophoresis which we will get onto later so what are the steps of pcr so first there is denaturation so uh at this stage the dna is heated up to 95 degrees celsius to denature the dna so what this means is that um if you guys, I'm going to just go back and show you guys that picture of DNA again. So as you can see, there are two strands of DNA, right? So, oh, and like, as you can see there, each strand kind of has its own um, base, uh, bases, so, or like nucleotides. So um, between them, they kind of bond together, I guess. So when you denature it, it will split into two. So you have like two different, two like it's kind of like you cut the um, DNA or like unzip it, if that makes sense. Next, uh, there's annealing. So there, these are, you use like primers for this um, step. And the, what the primers are, are they're like short little pieces of DNA. So they're around like 18 to 24 bases, bases long. And these go on the ends of the DNA and they're specially designed for each pair of DNA, DNA. And they bind to the template using like, again, uh, um, we talked about how adenine bonds to thymine and cytosine bonds to guanine. Um, they bind to the template. And this one is, uh, I'll guess, I guess I'll just draw it out for you. So um, it kind of looks like, um, once I figure out how to draw. All right, so it kind of looks like this. Um, where you have like your one DNA strand, uh, like one strand of DNA. And, and after you uh, split it in half, you have two, right? So you have like these two that are not bonded together anymore. Um, yeah, okay. So what these primers are, are like little short pieces of DNA. So they go on like the ends of, and say that this piece is the fragment that you want to, um, like that you want to kind of zoom in, right? Or make a bunch of copies of. So you have like the little primers that in this picture, they are not 18 to 24 bases long, but um, I will not be drawing like a really long strand of DNA. But uh, my art skills on the computer are just not that good. Um, so it, they're kind of like this where the red is a primer and the blue is the um, DNA. And so they're gonna, you have like, now you kind of have, as you, you can kind of see it at, that it goes like, like this one section is now like another full strand of DNA. All right. Um, so uh, uh, let me clear this first. All right. So after you go and put the, uh, or I should probably, ex do you guys like get the concept of primers or do you want me to explain it more? All right. So nobody's like saying anything I might, I guess I'll just like, finish for this like they bind to the ends of the DNA strand so um so they kind of um so what these are these are is that they're starting like kind of the actual copying stage so next is extension so these are like after um after annealing they're um the uh, reaction temperatures are raised again so forgot to mention that during annealing that uh, the temperatures are rate are like lowered a little bit, not like room temperature. So it's still really hot because 95 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it's like really, really hot, very uncomfortable. So um, these are raised again so that a poly polymerase, this is called TAC pol polymerase, oh, sorry. Um, this extends um, the primer to create a new strand of DNA. So I'll just like draw this out again, if that's, um, again, uh, so over or, I'll do, I'll do this thicker because uh, it's probably kind of hard to see. All right, so again, you have your um, DNA strands. Uh, yeah, and 
okay, this is uh, this is gonna be a little bit time consuming drawing all like the little um, bases on it, but yeah, just say that that's a um, DNA strand, right? So you have these these primers, and what the uh, what the tac polymerase will do is that it'll actually extend the primers. So um, it'll go and uh, I'll do this like purple for this. It'll go and extend these primers so that it goes all the way like this and kind of, so it, it'll it synthesize like a new like part to the DNA so that now um, after splitting one strand of um, DNA apart, you have two strands now. And um, wait, I'll well, just clear that. Okay. So what it kind of looks like is this, where you have one strand of DNA, it goes to two strands, and the, those two strands also separate into another two strands, and it just keeps on going and going maybe like around 35 times. So here you only have like one, two, and three, but it goes up to about like 35, um, it goes like 35 rounds. And um, it'll, uh, so like then you'll have like billions and billions of these little pieces of DNA. And this is helpful because, um, you know, if you wanna visualize like one really small piece of DNA, that's gonna be hard and you have to like, do all sorts of like you know it's not it's not very convenient so you do pcr now you have a bunch of different copies of the dna all right so now let's get on to gel electrophoresis so what this does is it separates the dna according to the size of dna fragments um i guess this will make sense a little bit more later and it runs a current through the gel containing the dna fragments you know usually this is uh, a gel called agarose gel which is like, it's like a polymer gel. And then based on the size and charge, the fragments will move through the gel at different speeds. Uh, I'll elaborate on this later. And this is also used to kind of visualize um, PCR or like, cause you know, after you have a bunch of um, little DNA fragments, what do you do with it? So you're gonna want to see it and like see, um, and kind of like see what's going on and like see the DNA, right? So using gel, uh, gel electrophoresis. So you use first um, the DNA samples. These are collected again from PCR. They are loaded into the wells on one end of the gel. And I just realized that it was kind of a bad idea to not have a picture here, but um, I'll just like go right here. Yeah. So these are the wells, um, they're labeled. And um, an electric current is applied so to move these samples through the gel. And um, if you guys know that DNA is negatively charged. And so something negatively charged will want to go to a positively charged place. So it's going to move across the gel over to the electrode. And then, um, base, okay, again, like I said, that they're going to be moved um, based on how small these fragments are and based on the sizes. So the slower, um, the, um, sorry, the bigger fragments will move slower and will not move um, like as much while the smaller fragments will be, um, will move quite far and um, move very fast. So over here, um, this is kind of like what a, um, what it looks like or like what the sample looks like. So first, as you can see, the really big ones are um, are like closest to the where the wells are, right? So while this really small ones are the farthest from the wells. So as you can see, um, the bigger ones will be slower and closer to where the samples are initially put while the fast, the smaller ones will tra uh, travel the fastest and the farthest away. Um, also, as you can see, there's like this little chart here um, to help visualize, um, like, see, as you can see, like the bigger ones, as the, like with a higher mole molecule size, then the distance migrated will be the shortest. All right. Next is capillary electrophoresis. This is another way of visualizing DNA, kind of like gel electrophoresis. Uh, one thing is that it is faster and a stronger current can be applied. So it's a little bit more like, it's kind of like a better way to do gel electrophoresis. All right, so first these small uh, DNA fragments, 
they're fluorescently labeled and they're loaded into the CE instrument. And what that means is basically capillary electrophoresis instrument. So it's kind of like the um, machine that does it all. Um, so next, uh, capillary array. So what a capillary array thing is, is that if you look in the top right corner of um, the slide, you can see like this thing. And the capillary array is like that orangey yellow thing. So it looks like little, um, I guess, like strands. And um, this is put into the well. OK, so after you have the DNA in the wells, I kind of for Yeah, so they're loaded into there, right? So the capillary array is also um, in the wells. So the ends of these capillary arrays are um, placed in a cathode. So a cathode has a negative charge. And this might be a little bit confusing because as you can see, like a cation is actually positive while a cathode is negative. And um, so just don't get confused between those two. It's called a cathode because the cation actually goes toward the cathode. And the same thing with an anode, um, an anion is negative, right? So the anion actually goes towards the positive. And these are buffers and they form an electric current um, in like the um, machine. And uh, this can, this is a little bit, well, is kind of like um, gel electrophoresis where um, the DNA travels from negative to um, positive. So um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's also like that. So it does work kind of similar in the way that it separates the DNA. All right, so next, um, the smallest fragments also move the fastest and travel the farthest. So um, the smallest fragments will be like the farthest in uh, farthest. And while the bigger fragments will be kind of there just trudging along. So um, the fragments move through a detection window. So as you can see here, it's like the this blue area, it is labeled detection window. So um, then the frag, uh, these, uh, so in here, you can see that there is a laser in the detection window. And what that does is remember like the, um, the DNA was originally labeled with fluorescent dyes. So this will ex excite the fluorescent label and this will emit light. And this will be recorded by a CCD camera. So this, the CCD camera converts light input into an electrical signal. And then this, um, the data is uh, then converted into peaks, which it can, where it can be analyzed. And um, I think I'll just, I didn't put a picture of capillary um, electrophoresis. So I guess I'm just gonna like pull up one from Google to like, because this, it actually looks very different from um, gel electrophoresis. So um, if I, like, I'll just, wait, here. Um, I, I, okay, that didn't work. Okay, there, that's what, um, that's what uh, capillary electrophoresis looks like, where, um, where the uh, little, where there's like peaks where you can view it. All right. So now we have visualizing the DNA analysis. So this is kind of like a little matching game where you have to match um, one type of DNA to the, like, sorry, one, um, one DNA fragment to the other. So, um, so in this picture, you can see that in the crime scene and suspect two, they both have the, like, they're, um, they're both at the same, um, they both have kind of the same sequencing, if that makes sense or like the same area of cells. All right, so um, if you guys have any questions, just um, you guys can ask in the q and I kind of forgot to mention that. Also, I don't know if you guys already know this, on the website, there is a um, place where you can submit questions. All right, so we have another practice question. I, give, I guess I can give you guys like two or three minutes, I'll say, I'll like put in three minutes.
All right. Um, you guys asked how old am I? I'm 14. Well, don't dox me. Please do not dox me. I prefer to not, um, you know, uh, like be revealed as in my school and personal life. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> mm, okay. Uh, I have a sister who uh, I am very, very highly influenced by who is a college freshman. So I guess that's where it comes from. Or, well, like not forensics, it teaches some, uh, it doesn't like it teaches about like these anaerobic um and aerobic uh what's it called like things so it uh it definitely like you can, you learn about some of these um what's it like these topics that are used in forensics but forensics is heavily influenced by biology so it'll like teach things that are will be used in forensics but not like this topic specifically All right, let's go on to the next question. Um, okay, that never mind. I don't know how the lot mouse works, but here's a uh, practice question number two. All right, so um, if nobody else is gonna answer, I guess I can just go on to the next question, which is the last question. Um, so our, oh wait, actually no, that, that was the last question. All right, so if you guys have any more uh, questions in general, I don't know, th there's not a lot of stuff that I can answer about like, but personally, like, I don't know, if you guys have any questions about stuff like, I don't know, Sayoli or something, you can, you can definitely ask. Whoa, that's a little bit like intruding, don't you think? <laughs> Finding people's locations. Um, also, if you guys have any questions, definitely check out like the website. Um, there is an area where you can um, where you can ask questions and like submit. Uh, submit like where uh, like where you want to like submit your questions sorry uh if you guys don't know where that is I can definitely screen share but <laughs> if you um but if you I think most of you guys probably know where it is but if you guys want just want me to just let me know
All right, so there was a question. I don't know if you guys can see the Q&A. Um, so there were some, it said like, what are some classes that you would suggest taking uh, if you're planning on friends doing forensics? So that actually, I do not know. Um, I got all my information like over time from just like Googling stuff, reading Wikipedia. So I guess you can do some like Googling. Um, there are definitely, there are probably some stuff like, uh, I don't know, like Coursera or something that you can find it, but, or also, is it ever too late to start slowly? Um, depends on what you mean by late. So if you mean by like, if you're a college freshman to start slowly, yes, that is too late. But like, I would say not really. Um, definitely there are so many people, um, there are like, so many people I know that have started slowly like in 11th grade or like 10th grade. So um, I think, I guess just like try out, right? So and plus there's also, there's always a, um, there's always like a, like a chance, I guess, or, and plus anybody can probably be good at it if you just studies or you just put in the work. So I don't think so. And that's not really that late, too late. Oh, haha. Ha. Speaking of build events, I suck at build events. I did Mission Possible for like half this year and um, managed to get DQ'd like once. Um, we all, it like never placed except for at like one thing where the places went up to 20th, which is kind of sad. 